thank you very much for being here and for inviting me. Um, uh, as probably everyone here, um, the Me Too movement and uh, its, um, its cascading effects uh, are things that are uh, integral to my life and also my work. Um, and things that I want to talk about, but it's not always easy to talk about them. And sometimes I'd rather not talk about it um, when I feel like it actually hurts me more to talk about this thing that is supposed to help me heal. Um, so I'm going to share some field notes uh, from what I do. I talk to uh, people of actually all ages, I would say maybe not under four, but four and up, uh, about things like this, about everything from bodily autonomy and who can touch your body and who cannot, to how do you ask somebody out and what do you do when they are really not interested? Um, how do you break up from a long-term marriage? How do you um, deal with body changing over the course of your life? So everything that has to do with sex and body uh, from a particularly emotional lens. When I think about uh, Me Too and things like that, sometimes my mind narrows into a certain subsection of the population. So I'm thinking of a certain age range, certain genders. I actually have certain like images in my mind of who I'm thinking about. Um, and so I just want to remind me and remind you that we're actually talking about a huge uh, or we're talking about everyone, you know, in terms of sexual harassment, we're talking about um, all kinds of people. So a diversity of ages, genders, life experiences, uh, abilities, um, whether they're considered attractive in traditional uh, conventional senses and all those things. So I'm trying to remind myself to do that and I'm reminding you too. So one of the things I'm seeing a lot is um, that either there is an absence of talk about consent and things like that, or when there, there is, there is a fervor around talking about it. There is a real passion. And that we're in, you know, we feel a lot of urgency to teach what consent is. And often it's taught um, something like this. This is just meant to be, isn't, it's meant to be cut off because um, it's just an example of the kinds of things that are out there available for educators to use. So point forms, you know, different uh, mnemonics uh, to help remember what consent is. And all of that focuses on teaching um, and uh, assuming that folks are not practicing possibly because they don't understand. When in fact, often we do understand consent uh, when it does not uh, have to deal with romance or sex or relationships that are intimate. Often, um, we trust people to practice consent, and there's no such mnemonics available for consent around borrowing someone's car or drinking the last beer in the fridge. Um, so it's interesting to me that you know we do a lot of this, and at the same time, um, so what I see in the world is a lot of people who know this stuff really, really well and really don't need to have you know time in a training with me going over them, or people who don't care and won't. And that by making it into a four-point plan, uh, I have not yet seen people have turn, turned around and said, oh, I didn't know. Thank you. Thank you that, uh, to tell me that it's, it's about choice. Um, what I also see is when people have absorbed this kind of material um, wholeheartedly, then what they see is how their practice falls short. And all over the place, when I give people a chance to say, do you feel bad about how you practice consent? And if they're avail it's available to answer that anonymously, they say yes. Um, some people say, I feel like I'm a bad feminist. I talk one thing, and I actually can't do it perfectly. I don't do it all the time, or don't do it with this one person because I'm afraid of hurting their feelings. Um, so I'm hearing that, and so it, it's just a, a, a seed in my mind to think, okay, how do we make it better? How do we make it easier to be who we are, which are imperfect human beings, um, and make choices so that they're oriented towards an ideal, but not necessarily um, 
rigidly governed by those ideals because it ends up making people feel really bad about themselves and disempowered, ironically. Um, what I'm also seeing a lot is disconnection and the desire for connection. So the feeling of loneliness, the feeling of, um, you know, I'm just returning to the dating market at 51. I'm feeling uh, lost as to what to do, what's the right thing to do. Very similar kind of um, monologue as I hear from 19-year-olds who are in college for the first time. Um, I don't know what to do. And so a lot of the substance use, a lot of the, the things that help us get through awkwardness and insecurity and um, worries um, are present. And so one of the, the sort of caveat of consent we talk about is that you have to be sober. You, if you, once you're inebriated, um, it doesn't work. So that's the current system, that's the current framework we have. At the same time, over and over again, I'm hearing from people, well, I can't have sex unless I'm high because I'm just too self-conscious. Um, and I hear this from people of all genders. Um, and also, you know, party culture and things like that that are connected um, very much to rape culture uh, a lot of the times, like they overlap and people use party culture sometimes, uh, take advantage of that as, as ways to manifest um, rape culture. Um, party culture is, is what people are using to um, adapt and survive their social difficulties. So how do we hold both those things? Um, how do we promote safety? and choice, as well as say, I understand it's scary to date and to possibly become naked with someone and be all up in their fluids. Like, it's, it's a scary thing. Um, instead of saying, um, well, don't do that, because then that, that takes away your agency, um, how do we have both? Those, that is a question that I often end up with. On the idea of, um, Disconnection, of course, there's social media that mediates and both like um, helps us feel further disconnected and helps us feel connected. And so many of the people I actually um, get to talk to sometimes say uh, that being able to have sex quickly and easily with somebody is a short fix for that loneliness, but it's not a real um, fix. And the lon loneliness that's connected specifically to masculinity is something I'm really curious about. And then the, the delicate nature of the sense of self that masculinity shapes people into um, is something that I'm hearing a lot of. And when people have a chance to anonym anonymously say um, they're having a hard time, I hear a lot of men and boys tell me they are. And then a lot of the things I don't want them to do are the ways they cope with that hard time. Um, this is just something I thought it was interesting. I was 12 and lifted up the skirt of a girl in my class, thought it was fun, didn't know it was wrong. My kids know better, so done chilling. I thought this was an amazing hashtag. It gives people something to do. It gives men and boys something to do um, as opposed to just be classified either as a bad man or a bad man we haven't yet discovered to be bad. The rise of women does not mean the fall of men. This is a theme that I keep running into uh, in my work is that I don't want to alienate these potential allies that I have in the world. One of the fall out that I see in this movement that I'm really concerned about is fear. There's so much fear to the point of male managers being uncomfortable mentoring women. Um, I don't want that. I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to stop that. Uh, stop. I'm going to stop that. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm going to stop talking, uh, and then we'll have some more discussion uh, in, in moments to come. Thank you.